deeply excited to have J.D. McPherson and band in the studios today here at the bridge. J.D., welcome back. And so good to be back, KCMO. Last time you were here with us, anyway, it was a solo acoustic thing, so pretty excited to get the, the whole band in here. Yeah, that was, uh, that was when I was here in the 60s. <laughs> so solo acoustic thing was really popular then. You know, you're, you're playing tonight at Knuckleheads, and you actually played Knuckleheads before with the Starkweather Boys? Yes, I did, a long, long, long time ago. And I remember Billy Sh Joe Shaver was on the bill. I can't believe I remember that. Yeah. I remember he was, well, I don't know if you can't hear, you can't see this on the radio, but he s would squat down on one knee and sing, and I thought that was really cool. <laughs> so maybe we'll look forward to that tonight at Knuckleheads from you? Some new moves. <laughs> <laughs> Trying that one out in front of the bathroom mirror? Yeah, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> uh, congratulations on the new record, Let the Good Times Roll. You've described it as uh, being sort of 50s psychedelic. That was a, that was a really silly uh, catchphrase that uh, I and the producer came up with in um, pre-production. It was about, you know, taking the, the parameters or the earmarks of rock and roll, 50s rock and roll, but turning them to 11, like, you know, tape delay, reverb, um, overdrive. But we didn't quite get to 11. We got more like, you know, four or five. <laughs> but two is what's usually there, so we went. Up. It seemed like it was going to be a really, uh, really crazy. We did do some crazy stuff but we didn't quite go to psych rock level but yeah. yeah well you know i think that's one of the sort of interesting ironies the first record you were viewed so much as a purist you know working in jimmy's studio with the vintage gear and trying to do everything you know from the the same way that they did it in the time that inspired it mm -hmm. uh and yet you have so many diverse influences like that 60s uh, acoustic rock stuff I was talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, and that first record was a record I always wanted to make. I always wanted to make a record that sounded like that, and I was so fortunate to be able to meet Jimmy and all the guys that are up there and played on that first record. And, I mean, it was like... It, and it's funny, it's because like, at some point, like that's, that's what everybody wants to talk about, is that it sounds like a 50s record. And, you know, the, the heathen in me kind of wants to throw a monkey wrench in that and and yeah what's what's funny is that uh, the second record all that stuff is there it's just um it's just kind of pulling from other sources too we were just listening to marty robbins um this morning in the van and don't worry about me has that fuzz guitar solo in it that was 1961 right so there's all these references from from early uh, early rock and country that are really crazy out there ideas and that's where kind of wanted to push it into a little bit and well, you use that on Caroline and Bridge Builder. Yep, that's right. Good. Wow. Yeah, I'm Way on go, it. Go, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, you've got punk influences too. Yeah, we got really funny hair and <laughs> torn up clothes, and yeah, it's, uh, man. You know, I just um, always was fascinated with that stuff, just mainly because there was. Um, there was always this sort of tribal feeling to every band. Every band had their own sort of manifesto, but you could all find it in the same scene. It seemed like in the best world, in the best you know part of the punk movement or whatever, there was all these different bands that were doing their own thing and sounded so completely different. Talking Heads sounds so completely different from the Ramones, from the Minutemen, from you know Stiff Little Fingers. They all sound different, but they all have this thing and. Um, also, the idea of doing everything yourself is a really good idea, or you know, trying to do a lot with a little, trying to do a lot with just a little bit of material. So you have the the rawness of that, and maybe there's a little bit more finesse in the '50s rock and roll, but that primal thing is still that common thread between the two. That's what was interesting to me when I first started getting into early rock and roll was that it was energetic and and raucous like the Ramones but it also had good musicianship like kind of musicianship in a way I don't want to say that the Ramones weren't good musicians but had more guitar I was a cream fan also so I wanted to hear some guitar so it was a uh, you know it was like hitting every hitting every key well I gotta tell you it's the uh, let the good times roll is just a great great record we'd Thank love you. to hear some music now if we could. cool this is um Let's do Crazy Horse first. This is a weird one. We just recorded this one recently. I actually recorded this one in Jimmy's studio for the Mr. Peabody and Sherman show. 
This is called Crazy Horse. Buffalo Bills A hundred in the hand Says what it means With the sound of thunder And the arrow scream Crazy, crazy horse ride See his face in the mountainside Strong little boy Name among the trees Kicking up dust In the land of dreams Through a lightning bolt Right across his face Hailstones raining all over the place One hand filled and the other hand raised Never got hit even though he got chased Crazy, crazy horse ride See his face in the mountainside Strong little boy named among the trees Kicking up dust in the land of dreams Hey! Spectacular. I really like that. You know, we were bemoaning the lack of caffeine in the room earlier, but that's all I need. <laughs> oh, man, we were really, we were really knocking back the coffee outside, so that's... <laughs> caffeine is the key that unlocks the day. So, uh, you know, the, when you got done with the first record, all of a sudden, you know, everybody has to make that second record. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's like that thing where it's like you have your whole life to do the first record, and then you know you've got a limited amount of time. Um, the first efforts that you made at at going back in for the second record, you weren't particularly happy. It was just uh, it was kind of like trying to. It was in a, it was actually in a strange like transitional period. We had like new guys playing with us, and it was like this idea of trying to recreate the environment of the first record and it wasn't the songs were just kind of pushing out a little bit I don't know I wasn't wasn't really happening um, in some ways so it was just like a matter of kind of describing what those sounds would be and what kind of um, borders there would be around it and then trying to figure out where to go to do that and uh, we ended up talking to this mad scientist from Valdosta, Georgia, named Mark Neal, um, who had made a lot of records that we all really liked. Um, and then also he kind of made his bones doing like some big rock records like the Black Keys Brothers, and which had a lot of great sounds that I love. I loved that record. I just thought it was so awesome that that, that kind of sound was coming out of the pop radio at the time. So talking to Mark was sort of like the most logical avenue to follow 
And there had been a lot of time that had gone from the first record to the recording of the second yeah. record, too, you know. And it, there's so much that had happened in your life that I'm assuming your writing changed a little bit during that process, too. Yeah, all of a sudden, you know, I'm in my, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 30 years old. And like, uh, I find myself completely uprooted from a life of, you know, punching a time clock and coming home every night to, you know, sleeping in a van. And it was, uh, it was a, it was a lot of things that come along with that mentally and uh, emotionally. And so, yeah, there was, um, I don't want to say it was a, yeah, I'll say it was a really, a much darker, <laughs> a darker slant on, uh, on an approach to writing. Um, but, you know, also just kind of wanting to keep pushing and experimenting and messing with things like narrative and messing with things like sound and, and you know, just getting a little more art school about it. Yeah, you described um, the sound as weirdo, bizarre stuff. Did I say that? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty, that's not a very good, that's not very lyrical, but that's <laughs> an accurate descriptor. <laughs> weirdo, bizarre, yeah. So just trying to stretch some of the boundaries and influences. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's also like, you know, the first record was really influenced a lot by, you know, my big love of my life, which was, you know, 50s rhythm and blues music. And then, then you know, there was a lot of things like Link Ray creeping into and Eddie Cochran creeping into the second stuff. Just it's like a different expression of the same thing. You know, one of the things that really surprised me when I was researching this is that after you wrote these songs, you kind of kept them in hiding. Yeah, you read every interview. That's a uh, that's scary. I'm a little <laughs> kind of nervous about the next stuff. Yeah, I was just nervous about It doesn't about get any them. darker than this. The the <laughs> the songs were just just weird enough that I was a little paranoid about sharing them with anyone. And it was kind of like one of those dual person kind of have two personalities, you know, maybe I shouldn't admit that, but one side of the personality, you know, one personality wants, believes, you know, is confident that they're, that they're good songs. You know, I believe like, yeah, I'm, I feel good about putting this out. And the other half is like, everyone is going to hate it except for me, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so it was, yeah, it wasn't the best way to do business. I'll, I'll admit that it wasn't good to drop these guys in the middle of a studio and say like, here's the songs. Let's I think those feelings are pretty human, though. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have doubt, you're probably yeah, not a very nice person. Yeah, and if doubt. you don't have the ego, you can't get up there and do it. Yeah. Man, uh, doubt is a, is a really f terrible, terrible thing, but I guess it's necessary. It uh, keeps you in check, keeps, your, keeps, your, uh, keeps you wanting to make better stuff. So... Um, you know, you always hear writers talk about it. You never know where inspiration's going to come from. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, you necessarily expect it to come from expired cold medication and a Frasier rerun. That's how I almost... I mean, I'm sure Abbey Road was written under those circumstances. <laughs> now, I was... Uh, yeah, that was a weird... But i got to say, uh, I, wrote, I wrote Let the Good Times Roll, in the, you know, in a really weird headspace, but that's... That's my favorite song. It's, uh, to me, in, in my mind, it's the most complete idea. It's got just enough subtext and just enough literal text that it makes kind of makes me happy. So I'm happy that that happened, but I will never take cold medicine ever again. You were having trouble breathing while you were writing that song. And my heart was beating uh, irregularly. And, uh, but it was like, uh, no one, you know, I've, I've, I've actually saw um, a response to a, to an interview where I talked about that one time, and I think there was like a, a pharmacist and a and a and a nurse practitioner that were arguing that that could even happen. I don't think that he took Tylenol cold PM because of the so and so level would the ratio would be. So maybe it wasn't the cold medicine. But maybe it was Frazier. <laughs> maybe it was Frazier. Yeah. It's just you know sitcoms can be that disruptive to you know your well being. Ah oh, man, I love Frazier. Frazier is nothing but. <laughs> pleasurable experience every time I watch it. Well, and on that happy note, can we get a little bit more music? Yeah. Um, let's see, we did crazy work. Let's do, uh, this is a song we did as a B-side uh, by our very good friend, Mr. Nick Lowe, who's just my favorite songwriter ever. This is called Rome Wasn't Built in a Day.
You don't know it, but I've made my mind up. You'll wind up in my arms. First, I'll have to break down your resistance to my charms. Yes, darling, I know it won't be easy, but I won't stop until I find a way. Everybody knows that Rome wasn't built in a day. I won't make it happen, I'm not certain I'm working on the plan And when I get it tight You'll believe I'm your man You don't know it yet But you'll surrender When I make my play Everybody knows that Rome wasn't built in a day. Our love for you protection, 24 hour love and affection. It'll take time to make it right. Take a look at what the Pharaoh did when he built his pyramid. Everybody knows that didn't spring up overnight There will be a celebration And the silver pen will play Everybody knows that Rome Wasn't built in a day really that special was. it's really nice Thanks. jd mcpherson in our studios today at the bridge and at knuckleheads tonight john moreland opens and he's great you really need to get in early everybody needs to go see john yeah really and good us, but john too and and john and us both both of them <laughs> john's amazing yeah he's a really good guy um you know we talked a little bit about uh, your songwriting, you had a chance to co-write with a couple of folks, and you, you wrote three songs with Eric Church, and I don't think we've seen or heard those yet, but uh, that had to be a fun experience. Yeah, that guy, that guy is really, I don't, I mean, I haven't been around anyone that, I mean, I'm sure there's people like that out there, but that guy is the most industrious, like, if there's a songwriting muscle... <laughs> That guy, I mean, that guy's like, I mean, it's just athletic almost how he can, I mean, we sat in a room for, you know, two hours and three fully formed things came out. Wow. And, um, you know, I was like, you know, I was really, really hoping that Eric would record all three, but he was, that was right when he was going in his sort of like more rock direction, you know, he's such a nice guy. He's been so good to us. Like he invited us out to play some shows like one one of his hometown shows was one that we played and you know that was incredible you know playing in an arena <laughs> try to get an acoustic bass in an arena and make that that's a challenge it's like <laughs> how do we fill this this up with that but what's what's cool is that you know his audience isn't the typical you know just like passive listener they're they're all like huge fans of his and they sort of respect his taste of who he brings along and he brings along some really unusual uh bands compared to what you know he plays and stuff so i don't know i've got nothing but respect for that guy you also did a co-write with dan auerbach of the black keys yeah he kind of challenged you yeah that was uh i think that happened like right maybe a year after the first record had come out and i had a couple of um had a couple of verses and kind of a chorus and a couple of chord changes for bridge builder and um, I was having a really hard time bringing that home. We actually tried to record that a couple of times, and it was just it wasn't finished. And um, he was he just started playing like these what ended up being the chorus chord changes, and 
I was like, you know what, man? I'm not really, f- I'm not really comfortable with those chord changes, man, you know? <laughs> and he's like, you like the Everly Brothers? And I was like, yeah. He goes, do you like the mid-career Everly Brothers? And I said, yeah. And he goes, then what's the, what's the problem? What's your problem? And I said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and it ended up being, you know, like one of my favorite favorite tracks on the record. And I don't know, it was just, uh, it was just lucky to, to get with him at that time when I was sort of trying to figure out what was going to happen next. And it kind of, that was another thing that kind of helped me push into writing some of these other songs. And just being broke down some resistance to yeah. always staying with formula. Yeah. You know, the, it's such a good record. I mean, start to finish, you've got to be so proud of it. Um, but I also uh, really love the video that you shot for Let the Good Times Roll. A couple of f- folks that you just uh, met in Chicago. Well, um, those are our friends, Kiko and Jezebel. I met them actually through Jimmy. I mean, they're like, they're like, um, they've just been around for a long time and they're just the coolest people in the whole world. They're just cool, you know? Like, you look at some people and you're just like, you know, Johnny Cash in 1960s, that guy's really cool, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean? yeah, yeah. And Kiko and Jezebel are just really cool and sweet and they had just had their first child and he was, they were super tired. And so we just invited him over to a house we were staying at and the camera and. So did you know. shoot that? Yeah. That's why it's blurry. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. It's beautiful. You know, just, you know, taking that couple and the newborn and, you know, and, and doing that, it sort of plays a little bit against, you know, the inspiration from the song. I don't think anybody in that video is on Tylenol PM, no. and, uh, but, you know, it works beautifully. Equal, probably, trying to stay awake. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, it's just it's such a good project, and, and the way that you've sort of insisted on growth between the first record and the second record makes us already look forward for the third. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to making a third record in another three years. Just kidding. No, that was a joke. Uh, no, it'll be two years. No, it, uh, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're excited to do it too. The best thing, I think the best thing that happened with, you know, the making of the second record was that it was a band at that point, that these, these guys, we'd all been touring together and playing together for a couple of years, you know, and it was, the first record was a lot of different people playing and this is like, it was more of a thing. So I leaned so heavily upon these gentlemen with me here. And so it's a pleasure to, to make music with them. The new record is called Let the Good Times Roll. And you can catch J.D. McPherson tonight at Knuckleheads. John Moreland opens. We'd love to get one more song. All right, cool. Could. Let's do Head Over Heels. We'll do that. You know, I'm going to take this opportunity live on the radio just to make sure that this string is in tune. Should we just do something with acoustic bass? Okay. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the uh, the artwork on the project. You've got a couple of grizzly bears. <laughs> I'm assuming I got that right. Yeah. Yep. There's, um, those are paintings by a guy named George Catlin, who is a painter of the American West, the kind of beginning of the settlement. And uh, the guy painted a lot of stuff, but my favorite stuff, or really the only, you know, most interested in his paintings of wildlife because they have a lot of personality. But I was just really struck with these images of these bears because they're, you know, their claws are out, but they also look kind of friendly in a way. And something about that. Happy to resonated. kill you. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> they're, they look real, uh, they look real chummy, but they're, you know, get the, they're bears. Yeah. But there was something about that and the, the name of the title that seemed to kind of fit together. But man, we had to really wrestle with the Smithsonian to get permission to use those. Really? Yeah, the Smithsonian, they're, <laughs> they like holding on to their artwork. That guitar you, you've got strapped around your neck, that belongs in the Smithsonian. Is there a story there? I'm not, wow. I'm not seeing one like that. So there's this guy that lives out in the desert named T.K. Smith, and he's a genius. As Masamune was to samurai swords, T.K. Smith is to uh, Paul Bixby-style uh, guitars. So 
Um, we had been talking about making this for a couple of years and finally got finished. It takes a really long time to make them, but it's kind of based on a guitar that Bo Diddley played in the early 60s. But then it's also got these Bixby pickups in it that are microphonic and kind of what like Grady Martin would have played. And it's got a couple of weird things. Like He made these little green circles, carved them out of a piece of Bakelite from a, tw- a comb, 1920s comb. Wow. And just, I don't know, I just feel complete with it. <laughs> it completes me. <laughs> so thanks. All right. All right. This is called Head Over Heels. Just spectacular. J.D. McPherson in our studios. The new album is Let the Good Times Roll. It's available now. I'm sure it'll be at the merch table tonight at a knucklehead. Nope, we're all out. Are you? No, just kidding. Nope. <laughs> we, got, we, got, we got a lot of those. All right, sounds good. Knuckleheads tonight, John Moreland opens, J.D. McPherson and band. You want to introduce the guys real quickly? Yes, please. Over here on the piano, we have our very good friend, Mr. Ray Hasildo. On the bass, we have our very good friend, Mr. Jimmy Sutton. On the drums, we have a pretty good guy, Jason Smay. (laughs) And over here, we have a pretty good guy, too, Doug Corcoran. No, they're all really good good buddies. Well, it's just been spectacular. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having us. It's an honor. Thank you. Yeah, tonight in Uncle Ed's J.D. McPherson, thanks for coming in. Our pleasure.